Today is May 18th, 1998. This is an interview with Jack Schwartz, and the interviewer is Lenore Bienenfeld Weinstein. The interview takes place in Orlando, Florida, in the United States, and the language is English. This is the first tape. My name is Lenore Bienenfeld Weinstein. Today's date is May 18th, 1998. I am conducting an interview with Jack Schwartz, and the interview takes place in Orlando, Florida, in the United States, and the language is English. Would you please tell me your name? My name is Jack Schwartz. Would you spell your name for me? Jack, very ordinarily, J-A-C-K Schwartz, S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z. What was your given name at birth? My given name at birth was Jacob, spelled J-A-K-O-B, Schwartz, spelled without a T. Uh, when I became a British subject, when I went on a kinder transport to uh, England, and later on, uh, when we left the castle where we lived during the war and I went out into the world actually and left the, uh, the structure of the, uh, of the castle, the kibbutz where we lived. There were about 180 boys and Jewish, Jewish boys and girls in the same predicament that I was in. We were all brought there, and we all lived there, self-sustained. What we did is we worked. We'll be getting to that, but I'd like to mm -hmm. just go back and mm -hmm. ask you um, about your childhood. First, mm -hmm. I'd like to know your date of birth. Well, I was born July 17, 1925, in Vienna. My childhood in Vienna and when I think back, it was about the most tranquil childhood that anyone could have. Uh, all the natural things, we went to school, and after school, we went to Kreda. And I was very active in, in the choirs, in the synagogue choirs, and I sang. I was a soloist. And so um, a lot of my time was taken up in choir practice and um, for the various Shabbat, uh, Friday nights and Saturdays, and uh, Yom Tovim, which is the holidays, of course, the high holidays. And I had various solos that I was singing. Before and we continue talking about your childhood, I'd like to first ask you about your family. What was your father's name? My father's name was Ozias or Oscar. He called himself Ozzy, Ozzyus Schwartz. And um, we were not, except he, uh, we weren't rich at all. He, he was a very hard worker. He dealt in jute, J, jute, J-U-T-E, sacking. And what he did, he assembled them, he, he bought them at one price and resold them again, again, to be reused again. And uh, he got up very early every, every morning and went about on his way to, to get these, these sacks and to resell them. I suppose they had to be uh, cleaned or something actually like that. It never took us so long to these things, you know, to these places. I know he worked very hard. He came home very tired and got up very, I don't think there was much money involved in this because it was a very 
small, uh, insignificant item, insignificant item actually, a sack where you'd put flour in or beans or, or potatoes or whatever. And so, but of course, they were necessary. It was a necessary thing, but I don't think there was. A, it was a big business at all, because there wasn't too much money in the house. Where was all. your father from? My father uh, came from Poland originally. He was born in Poland, and in the First World War, he actually fought for the Austro-Hungarian uh, army, and he was captured in Italy. Uh, and he was a prisoner in Italy, and he actually <coughs> contra contrived malaria, for which he suffered through his lifetime, through my lifetime that I knew. Uh, there are certain attacks that he had every now and again. He had certain attacks, and um, and he had to take certain medication because uh, I don't think in those days they knew too much about that. I knew how to handle it. He he got that in Italy, yeah, apparently. Oh boy, I remember that when he had and I, he was quite tough. And I remember when he had that, he was in such bad shape. Anyway. Um, nevertheless, he still went about his work. He went out and he did his his bit because he knew he had to make a living for us. Oh, every time I think of it, oh. <sighs> did you young. know his parents? His parents, no. I never knew his parents. They were in Poland somewhere at that particular time. Never knew them. I know he had a brother in, in Poland still. And as a matter of fact, his, his name was also Jacob, similar to mine. But uh, I never met them. I never spoke to them. Uh, he had a brother in New York by the name of Frank. And um, <coughs> when I was in England, he would send me letters to, and in, in them he said, would I write to his brother and tell him exactly how the situation is? Could he possibly do something for him? When in, in vain couldn't do anything, nothing. When did your father come to Vienna? He came right after, I suppose, when he was discharged from the army. I really, really don't know exactly, because he then married uh, my mother. Your mother's name? My mother's name was Sarah. And, uh, oh my gosh. Her and maiden they name? raised my brother with me, were born. What was your mother's maiden name? My mother's maiden name was Sarah Rosenhauch. And where was she from? And she was also from Poland. So actually, they were foreign in Vienna, and they spoke with a very heavy Polish accent. What can you tell me about your mother? But my mother, she was the kindest lady you could imagine. She was so kind, so kind. Um, Did you um, know any of her family? From her family, I'd never heard. She's, uh, she had a brother, my uncle Leon. He had a grocery store right in the street where we lived, of which very often we, I would help him. And we would go there and we'd you know, help him. Uncle Leon. And you were born in Vienna? I was born in Vienna. And that country is Vienna? Is Austria. 
And were there other children in your family? My brother. His name? My brother Norbert. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. Was he older or younger than you? He was my younger brother. Mm. And basically the same type of life that I had. You know, we went to school in the Tell morning. Tell me about school. My school was, uh, a, um, you know, a, uh, what they called a, um, a um, regular, you know, school. And then we went into the uh, Hauptschule. Which is what? Which is the next step from the uh, elementary school. Was it a public school? It was a public school, yes, indeed. And we also went to Hebrew schools and um, and uh, Cheder, a neighborhood Cheder, and we, and we belonged to uh, Zionist organizations, which was a very, very, very important thing for us in those days when we were young. Uh, almost everyone in the neighborhood belonged to a Zionist youth organization, and uh, our whole education was mainly based on um, what we call in those days Palestine, Palestina, you know, Israel, which is, of course we know as we know it as of now, and uh, to make Aliyah, to go to Israel, to live in Israel, and to uh, live and uh, on a kibbutz, and uh, actually that's how I became. Uh, involved uh, uh, and was sent to is uh, instead of Israel to uh, to England uh, on Hashara, which is actually a preparation uh, which prepares you uh, uh, agriculturally as to how to work the land and how to live in Israel. Were you in Hachshara in Vienna? I or? was in Hachshara. I was sent uh, from Vienna on Hachshara to a, a camp outside with a lot of other children. And the name of the organization at that time was Agudas Yisroel, Hapoel HaMizrahi, a branch of Agudas Yisroel. How old were you at the time? At the time, I was about 13, uh, 13, 14, going on 14. It was, I already had my bar mitzvah. A lot of my uh, friends had already left Vienna. Uh, we, we knew and we saw what was happening when Hitler marched into uh, Austria, uh, what they called the Anschluss, which is actually a com com combining of, of Austria to Germany. And they just walked in and actually saw the German soldiers march through the streets and uh, with the tanks and all the paraphernalia and all their might, which I thought, my gosh, who could possibly, you know, uh, beat them? They are so powerful. And thousands of soldiers marching in, 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 in this goose step uh, way that they had. And uh, all the cheering by the Austrians that was going on there. And from then on, of course, it became worse day by day. Before we the, talk uh, about it getting worse, I want to just go back and ask you about when you were in school, in the public school, who were your friends? Well, I had a lot of Jewish friends. Did you have any non-Jewish friends? I had some non-Jewish friends. Uh, also, of course, because it was a mixed school, it wasn't a Jewish school. But very soon, it, uh, we became aware of the division because um, as we, as the Jewish kids belong to the Zionist organizations, a lot of the uh, Gentile kids 
had already been uh, infiltrated by the Nazis, uh, and their minds were also uh, uh, kind of uh, brainwashed with this anti-Semitism that was uh, taught to them at a very, very early age. Very often I think that, uh, that they actually took this anti-Semitism from their mother's breasts because surely I, I don't think that they understood it or knew exactly what it meant because very often we were good friends with them. We played in the streets together. They never knew anything about Jewish or Christian. We respected each other. Uh, as Jewish or, or, or non-Jewish, very often they would come to our house on Friday or on, on Shabbos to light, light a can, uh, to light the light or anything, and they knew that they were, they knew that they were the Shabbos goyim, and they knew the meaning and the, and the translation of it, because we were constantly uh, in uh, in touch with them. And uh, whatever they did, they knew that this is the custom and that's the way. But to really be anti-Semitic anti with the hate that they then further received later on. And you could actually see this because soon thereafter, soon thereafter, and I believe me, it was not long, they came and rounded and harassed the Jews, they rounded them up, and they went from door to door, and they collected Jewish uh, people, uh, rabbis with beards, with long beards, and they, would, they took them into the streets and ridiculed them and harassed them what and dear. punched them around and, and kicked them and actually made them go into the streets where there was some writing on the streets in, in white enamel paint that was uh, propaganda, uh, political propagandist uh, writing that uh, wrote, similar to the type of uh, stripes that you see in the middle of the road. Uh, and they'd made, they'd made older people try to scrub it off with, and they gave them a toothbrush and a bucket, which was actually impossible. And they ridiculed them and kicked them and made them feel like animals, like dogs in the street and shouted insults and then actually cut their beards off with scissors that they had in their pockets and punched these older people around and ridiculed them and made fun of them. And so that this anti-Semitism was actually so strong and felt so badly. Every child, every Jewish child was almost afraid to walk the street because they already had this uniformed uh, Hitler youth whom they had instructed in the art of harassment. What years and are we talking about? We're talking in the, uh, in the year of 38 and 39, the year of 1938 and 1939. Before we continue in those years, I want to go Bef back earlier. Yes, well, just before the Anschluss, before they came, before the Germans came in, they had, uh, well, I won't say an illegal uh, SR, uh, which, these uh, Nazis had these un these brown uniforms and with their uh, with their boots and all that they dressed and usually had parades and stuff like that and went around in the streets trying to recruit other uh, Nazis into their organizations and as such they would go then and harass all Jews that they saw on the street and uh, Jewish stores, they would write with that white paint on their, on their windows, on their show windows, a, a Jew, this is a Jewish place. In other words, they'd write 
Jude or Judengeschäft do not deal with uh, with Jews here. Buy only from uh, from Aryans, as they call themselves Aryans, and uh, and it would constantly uh, push the Jews around and ridicule them. When uh, let me ask you: You went to a public school. When in your early schooling, was there anti-Semitism in no. the class? No, my early schooling, my very early until. Uh, you could sometimes feel it or see it, uh, but the, the, for some reason or other they were anti-Semitic. I don't know for what reason, because basically uh, we were all in the same time, in the same, uh, in the same uh, income type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Area. I, I don't think there were many Jews in my area that were so uh, rich or so elaborate in any way that they have outshone uh, any of the other Gentiles because they didn't. Oh, maybe somebody had a, a store like the, uh, my uncle had a grocery store, but that was no uh, gold mine. I mean, it was. They what sold bread and butter and uh, milk and uh, the type of stuff that everyone needs to have, but not in such large quantities or anything like that. What about so, from the teachers? Teachers, some teachers would would be very anti-Semitic and make fun of Jewish names and uh, and insert certain snide remarks about Jews every now and again. This would uh, come out in a class or in a conversation or in a uh, in a uh, whatever we would uh, read or study, and, and they would then in, insert a little anti-Semitism. And of course, these Gentile students would look and make fun of the of the Jewish kids thereafter. And somehow, more or less, it was, it was expected of them, uh, you know, being that they joined the Hitler Youth, uh, that they couldn't uh, really, uh, you know, uh, be any different from all the other, uh, from all the other Gentiles, and so they would just participate and be very free in in baiting, very very free. Nothing would stop them. What at was, all. What was Cheder like? Cheder was, uh, it was actually a, a, a room that was rented by the, uh, by the Jewish uh, elderly of the, of the area in order to uh, give uh, the Jewish children, uh, to take them off the street and to give them a little Jewish education and teach them. Uh, about, about the various uh, uh, holidays and uh, history of Judaism. They would teach us Chumash, the Chumash, and uh, the, uh, the various, what they call the Sidra, the, the things that was read, that were read that particular week in the Torah. Uh, and what the portion was, we would study that, and we would learn how to read and write Hebrew, and uh, we enjoyed it. Most of the kids went uh, voluntarily, quite voluntarily, because we're mostly our friends, and we were all in the same boat, and, and it was important that we knew that, because our backgrounds, our parents were that way. and. Uh, what was your family's religious background? My family's religious background was extremely, extremely orthodox. Um, we leaned more to the Hasidic uh, way of, to the uh, very, very orthodox way of living. Everything in the house was 100% kosher, always. The different dishes that we had, we had uh, uh, mil milk, what we call milk-a-dick and uh, flesh-a-dick dishes. 
and Pesa for, for Passover. We had Passover dishes uh, that were brought up from the basement for Passover. The whole house was, uh, when Pesach came, was specially prepared for the Passover, for the week of Passover. And so I remember at every time, at any holiday, whatever holiday came, the house was prepared. And every Friday night and every uh, Shabbos, uh, uh, Sabbath and Friday night, the preparations my mother had cooked for Friday, for the Friday meal, and the smells were just tremendous. And I, I still remember them of the fish, the gefilte fish. And uh, my mother even baked Carly herself. And um, she would uh, make, bake certain cakes. She would make uh, um, lake if she would, she would bake. Um, which was so good, and um, she also made a sponge cake that we loved. And uh, she was a tremendous good cook, and all the preparation. And uh, of course, on the Friday night before when Shabbos came, uh, we all went to, to Shul, we went to the temple. Friday nights. And so when we came home from the temple, everything was prepared. All the food and the candle lights were lit every Friday night. And we also had a chulent oven for Saturday so that nothing would have to be cooked uh, or prepared. Everything was already prepared and kept warm, warm in the chulent oven for Saturday so that we had warm meals. And uh, all we had to do is just take it out and, 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 and serve it. We're coming to the end of the first tape now. Ninety-eight, and you were describing a typical Shabbos in your household when you mm -hmm. were a child. Mm -hmm. The lights and the candle lights were always there, and the Shabbos table, and we all sat around it. My uncle Leon was there. Uh, the whole family, as a matter of fact, Uncle Leon lived with us, uh, and. Um, he stayed with us, so on Friday night we all had the Shabbos meal and together. Uh, something that I'll always remember, never, never, ever forget. I uh, would like to air something that is on my mind a lot, and especially the word uh, uh, of uh, of being a um, a survivor uh, to be a survivor in my mind actually is a survivor that actually survived the concentration camp uh, but for the grace of God maybe there go I and as such maybe I am a survivor but to be a survivor, in my mind, actually, is someone who went through the ordeal of a concentration camp and has the numbers stamped on his arm. That's what I call surviving. And when that, that person survived the concentration camp, that is a survivor. My hat goes off to people like that. And uh, it's not something to be admired for, but it's, that is a survivor. Okay. Surely, uh, I survived maybe as a, uh, as a member of my family, of those that didn't die. 
like my mother and father, they died in concentration camp. My father was taken to Buchenwald. And then this is where he was murdered and this is where he died. And my mother was taken to Theresienstadt. And then she was shipped from Theresienstadt, maybe to Auschwitz. And from there on, there was no trace. Those people, these are my people, they died. And as such, maybe I survived the family by being sent to, on a kinder transport to uh, England. And as such, I survived. I'd like to, before we get into those experiences, I'd like to ask you about your home in Vienna when you were a child. What are some of your memories of what your house looked like? My house was a very tranquil house with my mother and my father. They always dwelled over us. Their love was 100% consumed for us, for my brother and myself. They gave us whatever they had, and a hundred percent of them, a hundred percent, they actually sacrificed themselves. This is the feeling that I have. They actually sacrificed them themselves for us. What was your neighborhood like? My neighborhood was a street that was, I would say, uh, at least 60 to 65 or 70, 75 percent Jewish. Uh, my building, I would say, was a building that I, I lived in was like an apartment building. In the building, I think there was something like uh, 30 to 40 apartments and different levels. And it was a walk-up type of a building. It had about four or five flights. And most of the people in the building were Jewish. There were a few Gentiles that lived in the building. Uh, Again, as I say, said before, they changed completely. Their sons became Hitler youth and changed and suddenly became our enemies, our arch enemies. How large was your apartment? Our apartment had two bedrooms, a living room and, and a kitchen and a bathroom. It wasn't a large. We all lived in there, my mom and dad and my brother together. And my uncle lived in another, another bedroom. And uh, we had to walk up about a flight and a half to the apartment. And... Um, How far was your school? My school was about uh, three or four blocks from the, uh, from the apartment. So uh, we had to walk it. It wasn't really far. It was quite easily an easy walk, except, of course, in the winter when it was cold and ice and snow. And so we had to drudge, drudge through the snow and through the ice and walk it. You said you were a member of Hapoel Hamizrahi yes. and Zionist groups. Yes. How far were they? Oh, that group was quite a distance away. It was about maybe 10, 12 blocks away. We walked it. How often? Uh, we walked it every, every day, every day, in maybe groups of twos or threes. Together we walked to it, and we met, and we talked about then Israel and how 
to make Aliyah and how to, and if we were lucky enough to be sent there, of which I was one day chosen uh, to go on Hakshara. And we went on Hakshara in, in oh, a few kilo kilometers away from Vienna for about a week or two. Whereas then, uh, my name was called out that uh, the uh, Hakshara in Austria had stopped and that we were being sent to uh, further our Hakshara to England on a transport, on a kinder transport. How old were you at this time? I was at this time, I uh, was about 13. Hey, where was your bar mitzvah? My bar mitzvah was in Vienna, and I had it there. Uh, one of my friends was a ten, another friend had left. He'd gone to, uh, to England, uh, but not on a kinder transport. He had some rel relatives there. I was lucky to have been sent on. I remember the day. Before we talk about that day, um, I'd like you to tell me what you remember from your bar mitzvah. Well, I remember my bar mitzvah was held at a, at a shul, at an orthodox shul, and I was being taught by the rabbi, and um, I knew my Hebrew quite well, and so it went off real well and real easy. And uh, I had a, a speech that I had prepared, that I'd made to the uh, to the um, to the shul, uh, to the public, and to my, to all my friends and to my parents. Well, thereafter, of course, the days were quite uh, different and unusual. A lot of the kids were being dispersed and and sent away, and uh, we couldn't meet as often. When, yeah. when you were a child, you, um, did you take summer vacations anywhere? Yes, I was sent by the, uh, not, not with the family, but my parents sent me uh, to uh, summer vacations to Jewish camps, uh, which was done through the Vienna Kultusgemeinde, the Jewish, uh, the Jewish equivalent of, of a JCC in Austria, and we were sent on uh, out into the country for about a week or so. And we spent that in the camp. It was very, very, very beautiful. And you said you also enjoyed singing in your shul choir. I enjoyed singing in my shul. I had a very good voice when I was young, when I was a youngster, extremely good, and so much so I was made soloist of the entire choir. I had lots of solos. And uh, by the way, there was also a salary involved being in the choir. I'd earned uh, a salary every week or every month, so which I contributed to the, uh, to the family. And uh, because the money was needed very badly. Because, as I said, we weren't too well off. At, uh, what, um, at what point were you aware of Hitler's rise to power? When I saw the Anschluss, when the Anschluss, which is the year uh, when Hitler came in. Had you known about what was happening in Germany before that? I knew what was happening before that because we naturally you hear the news and you hear grown-ups talk of what was happening in germany and what was happening to the jews and we dreaded that hopefully it would not happen in austria we knew it was happening in germany to some of the jews 
But then, of course, here it came to our, to our doorstep, right in Vienna, in Austria, and the same thing happened. So we knew because uh, before that, they had all these uh, illegal Nazis parading through the streets and actually uh, cheering on what the Germans stood for, what the Nazi movement stood for, and how much they wanted the Nazis to come to Austria. And uh, so much so that we, we, this was a daily type of affair. We knew what was going on. And when the, uh, when the Germans actually came, I mean, everything changed. They were here, and they were the, uh, the masters of the country and the street. They were Nazis, and that was it. And Jews were just second-class citizens. Actually, they were nothing. They had no rights. All rights were taken away from them, everything. Even our schools were taken away from us, and we weren't allowed to go to school anymore. So that with the help of the uh, equivalent, as I said, of the JCC, the Jewish Kultusgemeinde, they were able to uh, to acquire a school for which most Jewish children would then continue their, their, their schooling during the day. Of course, it was quite away from where we lived. It was uh, a long distance. And uh, we either had to take a tramway or walk it. And of course, in the bad weather, or when it was raining, or when it was cold, we missed it. But uh, we did attend as much as we possibly could. When did that start? That started right soon after Hitler came. Soon after the Nazis came to Austria. I mean, like a curtain fell on everything that was, on the whole life that we had before. It changed completely. It was a different life altogether. We were constantly being harassed, not only by uh, talk, but at gunpoint, at, with bayonets in the street, those Nazis, with their helmets and their guns, they were drowned up and they came and arrested the fathers, the Jewish fathers. And they converted certain buildings, schools or houses. They would take over the entire school and they'd make it into a, a kind of a prison where they'd hurt all the Jewish men and keep them there. Uh, arrested them and keep them there because they didn't actually have any jails. So this is what they did. And they just took them without any warnings or anything. They told you come and follow them and go with them. And they'd keep them. The wives, the mothers, and the children would have to wait for a week or two or three to have any news from the mothers and fathers. And this was a constant kind of a harassment. You had to live with this type of living. And somehow word went through the various vines, through the streets. There's going to be arrests today or tonight. And lots of people, fathers and children, would seek certain other places where they would sleep overnight away or hide themselves away from this. What they would gain from this, I don't know in the long run, because if it isn't today, it's, it would be tomorrow. Not tomorrow, it would be the day after, 
but eventually they would all be caught. Actually, there was very little income in those days, very little, almost nothing. It trickled down to almost nothing. What happened and to your father's uh, business? Well, my father's business was went to a complete standstill, a complete no, no, nothing. We, we had to actually depend on welfare, kitchens, for food that was, I suppose, supplied through the kindness of, of, of the uh, American Jewry or World Jewry elsewhere, donations where they were able to uh, put up kitchens and cook some nutritious soups that they called soup kitchens where the, some of the Jewish people would go because they were hungry. There was, nothing, there was no money to buy food. They would go to these places for a bowl of soup, for a piece of bread, it just in order to survive. And this is where we would go. Furthermore, there was no money either to buy clothing for the children and stuff like that. And there were places where some of the older clothes and clothing was gathered up from whence they came from, I really don't know, but there were piles some places that we went, there were piles of clothing there that we went to choose from because we had to have shoes, we needed socks, we needed shirts and jackets, donations from where they, where they came from, I really don't know, maybe from other countries, but they were sent there and we were able to pick the things that we needed and wanted because if it weren't for that, we wouldn't have anything. We wouldn't have anything to wear. We wouldn't have anything to eat. I remember those days. I remember them. They were so hard. And I remember when my mother overshone and I said to her, I was hungry. And all she was able to give me is take a slice of bread and slice it, not even butter on the bread. She'd give me a slice of dry bread. As, as a child, I remember it now. I didn't understand it. How come there's no butter on the bread? I would say scornfully to my mother. And with tears in them on her in her face. She didn't couldn't tell me. She didn't know why. But she gave me the slice of bread. And she says, Eat my kid, my lovely child. <laughs> As we just don't have the money to buy butter. And something that was never used to. There was always butter. And if there wasn't butter, there was schmaltz that she would make from chicken fat. But she didn't have that. She didn't even have that even. You know, scornfully, I remember being mad at my mother as a child. I didn't know. Why is never butter on the bread? Why do you give me just plain bread? It's so sad when I remember that. It hurts me so much. Trying to remember that. It wasn't her fault. It wasn't her fault at all. I'll never forget it, never for the rest of my life, ever. It was more of a punishment to my mother than it was to me. I know that. I know that. Yes. 
But those were the times, those were the days. We just didn't have anything. We depended on charities. Otherwise, we'd starve to death. We didn't have that. And I know now how important it is to help others that don't have anything and need it, and what the circumstances are. It's very, very important. I'll never forget those days. And I'm mad at myself for being so mad at my mother, not being, not understanding the feeling that she must have had when she gave me that piece of bread. Uh, well, that's it. That is something I'll never forget, but something that has taught me the greatest lesson in the world, and I hope I'll never forget it, ever, never. But that's it. And that was the reason, if I can tell you, I can tell you my story thereafter. Uh, when I went to England. How did it come up that you were chosen or went to England? Pardon? How did it happen that you were sent or went to England? It happened that I was chosen through Hapoel HaMizrahi to continue my uh, hashara, my preparedness for, for Israel, to Aliyah, to go to Israel, to England. When was this? And this was in 1939. It was just about, not, oh, I would say about three to four weeks before the war with England had started. It was the end of July, almost August of 1939. Where were you during Kristallnacht? Oh, Kristallnacht, I'll never forget. I'll never forget Kristallnacht. I remember the commotion. I remember the commotion like it was yesterday on the radio, on the, uh, wherever you went, in the streets, the Nazis would go through the streets and break all the, all the Jewish store windows and herd all the Jews together to arrest them. And why we had found out, because it was someone it was a Jew who had shot uh, a German in Paris, uh, a German um, ambassador to Paris, and this Jew had shot this German, and because of that, Hitler decreed that the Jews would have to pay finally for that. And so they went throughout all the streets and they started to destroy all the temple. They called it Kristallnacht. Why did they call it Kristallnacht? Because Kristall is the German word for crystal. What this, the significance of this was that they went and destroyed all the synagogues. One of the most beautiful synagogues that you would ever want to see was in my neighborhood. It was called the Klucki Temple. Uh, this was one of the most beautiful, opulent synagogues you, have, you would ever want to see. It was, the uh, interior was so opulent. It was all in turquoise and gold with the most beautiful uh, windows, uh, decorated with windows. 
that you would see through the sun that uh, that brought the most beautiful light in on a sunny day on a sunny afternoon on a Shab Shabbat afternoon when we went there but anyway I was in the street uh, when I heard all this going on and so they started the opposite my house was a little shul what they call a little stubel but those Nazis knew what it was they went right over there it was actually a store that was converted into a into a, a, a stubel a, a shilacho they called it a shilacho mean, meaning a small little shul they gave it endearment by calling it a shilacho and uh, this is a place where my father over Sholem went to say shacharit every morning whenever when someone had your your sight and you needed a minion real fast it was easy to uh, to get a minion to call people together in the street because there were it was easy to go from one house to another to uh, to get a few men together to make it to make it a minion and um, this is one place that we liked very much because it was so close to us and it was so dear to us and f Saturday night at the conclusion of Shabbos there's always Shalashidas and I will never forget that Shalashidas Havdalah when they made Havdalah there where we all sat around our tables we made Havdalah and this was the first break we had shalashidas, which means, of course, maybe eight things uh, was were being served. I think it was the first bite uh, of halamoid, which is the, the the beginning of next of the early week. We're coming uh, to the end of the tape now. We're coming to the end of the tape. and you were describing the shul, Stiebel, across the, the street. Stiebel across the street. And I want to uh, carry on with this. And uh, how they went in there. I, I was telling you about Chalashi. This where all the elders of the shul and all the, the fathers. Uh, after Havdala, we all sat around and we had the, a break. Of, and uh, people brought things to eat. I think the main thing was... Uh, was they opened up a can of sardines and they opened up uh, uh, some um, uh, herring and those that wanted herring and then they, and they I think they uh, had a little schnapps the elderly people had a little schnapps anyway and this was the beginning uh, also it was the beginning of the new week and so we opened up the the store my uncle Leon opened it and carried bread and all that so he brought in fresh bread and we all sat down and we sang uh, Jewish songs and we welcomed the new week after Shalish, after after Havdala and uh, we had Shalishidas and we ate all that and it was a happy time and uh, on that Kristallnacht, this is how I got to talk about Kristallnacht. They came and they destroyed, virtually destroyed that little, that little stable, that little shilako. They went in there and just tore it apart, piece by piece. And I would never believe it. Huh? Grown-up people, they go in, they tear everything. They took the sidurim, the sidurs, the prayer books, and the Torahs, and the Torah curtain in front of the door they tore it down and they set it on fire in the street now this was just a little shul not the Kluki temple was about a block and a half two blocks away that big Kluki temple that beautiful temple that was so beautiful I'll never forget that actually destroyed that they actually destroyed it they took 
through stones, through these beautiful windows and shattered them. And there was charts all over the floor, all over the sidewalks, more and more so. And then they threw uh, what they called facults, facults. These are torches, actual torches. They called it Fackelnacht. That is the German word for a for a torch, a fackel. F A C K E L. That's a German spelling of it. And they torched it, and they threw it through the open windows, and then they went in there and they tore everything apart. That was the most beautiful organ, a gold pipings and everything. They just destroyed it and tore it into ten thousand pieces. All the charts were all over, and the smoke and everything on the sidewalk, in the streets. Every Gentile, every Nazi, everyone participated, and they were so proud. Tell me that they, uh, there are some that didn't, that believe in that. They all believed in it, all of them, every one of them. No one stood there and said, please don't do that, don't go there, it's a holy place, why go, why do that? Everybody participated, and you never saw so much glass all over, all over the sidewalk, in the streets, and they built a, uh, a, a fire, an a, a actual torch, torch the, uh, in the middle of the street, they, 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 like a regular uh, fire, uh, in the middle of the street, and on it they kept throwing all the sidurim and all the uh, pieces of the Torah, it tore it up into 10,000 pieces. They rolled it out on the street, and they walked over it, and they tore it. I stood on the, on the, on the ledge on a shelf of a little window about yay tall. And I had a complete oversight of the whole thing. I saw everything that was going on. Everything is impregnated in my mind. I saw it. I saw it with my own eyes. And they broke these windows and tore that apart, that synagogue, into the worst thing. The entire street smelled from smoke. And there were pails of smoke all over the street, and the smell and charge all over the street, glass. That's why they call it Kristallnacht. And this is what they did all over, not just in my neighborhood, not just my synagogue, but all over Israel, wherever there was a synagogue, they did that. And that's what they call Kristallnacht. And whoever sees this, they should have. And imagine this, imagine this, what they did. And with such hate, why, what, what, what could possibly be so hateful about, about a, a Torah, about a synagogue to destroy such a beautiful place? be the same thing as going into a cathedral and destroying it for no reason at all. Who would do such a thing? No one in the whole wide world would do a thing like that. No one would do that. Only the, the disturbed mind of a Nazi, of an anti-Semite, whatever went, flew through their blood, some, some kind of anti-Semitism that was in them. But they did a thing like that for what reason? What could have been in their brains, those stupid people, to destroy families, destroy homes, destroy ideals, living ideals, tear people apart, families apart, take them away to concentration camps and kill them. Well, this is the memory of the Kristallnacht. I was in it. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw it. I saw what was happening. 
I'd like everyone to know it and see it. If ever, I don't suppose they would have a, a picture of it, but see it in the minds as I do and imagine it. And for what reason? No reason whatsoever. No. But they did that. You can't take that away from them. It's hateful. Hateful. And they enjoyed it more, more than anything. What can I tell you? I could go on for, for a long time and tell you about this. Some places it's still going on today even. Yes, indeed, there are some people today that have this kind of hate that nothing, nothing in there, nothing, for, not, for no reason whatsoever. Because if you ask them, they don't know. They have no idea. It's just bred into them. They got it from their mother's milk when they were children. That was inbred into them. I don't know. Anyway, it happened. Did your family ever talk about leaving? My family talked about leaving. Yes, indeed, they did, but they couldn't. They were poor. They did. And they had relatives. They had an uncle, a brother of my father in New York. Apparently, we couldn't do anything. He. He didn't do anything. He couldn't, he wouldn't, I don't know, he couldn't. But he didn't, he didn't do anything. So the end was my father and my mother perished in the Holocaust. They perished in the concentration camps. Well, I don't know how long this goes on. And now this is the reason why I say uh, my opinion about a survivor. There are people that lived in the concentration camp and survived all that. And they have marks to show on their arms to say they are really the survivors. They are the ones that are the survivors. Again, I say, some people say that I am a survivor. Maybe so. I survived. I survived the Holocaust by being, by having, been, having been exceptionally lucky to be sent out with a kinder transport to Britain, to England. Tell me about the day that you left. The day I left, I'll never forget. My mom and dad and my brother, my younger brother, came to the... Uh, to the uh, train station to put me on the uh, on the train. I knew then, I knew then I would never ever see them. I knew it. I knew it in my heart. I knew I would never see them ever again. So anyway. I was sent to England. Where did you board the train? We boarded the, we, we, we let, we boarded the train in Vienna, and we traveled all night. Who was with on you? The, with, there were several other children, other Jewish children on the train. I would say about 60, 70, or 80 from Vienna. Anyway, we traveled on the train through uh, Germany, through Belgium, and through Holland. We arrived the next morning at the Hook of Holland, where we boarded a ship. And on that ship, at that particular morning, I remember children that I didn't know that came from other parts of Germany, that came from, from Berlin, that came from uh, Dresden, from uh, Hanover, Jewish children that were in the same boat as I was. I became very, very good friends with them later in England. Uh, there were altogether about uh, 200 altogether that, we, that, that assembled there at the Hook of Holland. From there, we were put on a ship and then 
uh, went across the channel to uh, uh, Greenwich. Was anybody in England. charge of you? The, yes, there were some uh, grown-ups, some uh, uh, leaders that they called, uh, I think they called them uh, Mashkir, which was the equivalent of someone of being in charge of the youth. Well, elder, elder guys, people that were trained in the, in the method of how to handle us. They were a little older. At any rate, we, when we arrived in England, we were sent to a place in, in southern England, in a place called Ashford, a little town outside of Ashford, and we were put up in a tent camp. What had you taken with you? Well, have, what had I taken with me? I'd taken my essential belongings, like the stuff that I was wearing, plus a few shirts, toothpaste and toothbrush. That's about all. Also, I remember I have the letters here that my uh, father and my mom sent to me uh, about blankets, uh, a down, a feather down, uh, a, a down, down feather spread, that they were so worried about uh, the uh, the letters, if you want me to show the letters or something, they, in that they insisted I should take real good care of the downs because it was something that they had for a long time and assembled and that I should be warm and uh, not catch a cold and they're mainly concerned about my health all the time. What did you do for food on the trip? On the train? There was no food on the train, actually, except the sandwiches that we brought from home. Maybe a sandwich, but there weren't any. Did I remember not? that during, during the train ride, Nazi, uh, uh, Nazi soldiers coming through the carts, inspecting all the children to see if we had any valuables, gold or anything like that, I had, uh, I think, a gold chain that my mother had given me with a mezuzah. I remember them taking that away from me. They took that away from me. But I said to hell with it, so long as I let them keep it, you know, I can always get another one. And they took that away with it. I was very happy to get on board ship. The next morning we were served breakfast. Food that was very unusual, the type of food that we were not used to. They had bread, what they called white bread. Uh, and they said sliced it so thin that I didn't even, it was almost paper thin. And I, 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 I admired it more than I uh, wanted to eat it. I was so amazed. What in the world is this here? Who's, who eats bread that thinly sliced? It was almost paper thin. But that's the English style, you know, of uh, having these little finger sandwiches, very thinly sliced and all that. Um, I remember eating that, and I was very glad of it. And uh, I remember that. Uh, as, that, as that were a big deal, of course, you know, anything like that it was strange. So it was, it was different. What other so, memories do you have from that trip? What other memories? I remember meeting all uh, new new friends, the, uh, friends I befriended. I became very close with. Uh, and whom we. Uh, um, I buddied around with in England then in the, in, the, in the tent camp actually we couldn't leave or anything like that and uh, I remember receiving letters from my father and my mother where they would say see if I could find someone that could send them a permit or an affidavit as they called it in those days that would sponsor them 
to get out of, of Vienna and how important it was that I could find something. But I couldn't. We, would, we weren't let out. Finally... What was the tent camp like? The tent camp. We lived in that tent camp for, I'd say, about a week, a week and a half to two weeks when war had broken out, when the Germans started to bomb Poland, Warsaw, and then when Britain declared war on Germany, so the war had started. Soon after that, about uh, two or three days of that, the Germans came to bomb London. In order to go to London, they would have to fly over the tent camp. Now, this was very dangerous because from the air, a bunch of tents would look like an army camp. So the people who took care of us, the Jewish uh, authorities in, in Britain and uh, whoever took care of that, knew how dangerous it was, how dangerous it was, that we mustn't stay in these tent camps. So we were transferred. Within about a day or two, all of us were gathered. There was about 190, uh, almost close to 200 boys and girls from all various parts of Europe, from Germany, from Austria, from Czechoslovakia. And we were sent up north to North Wales. And we were put up, believe it or not, in a castle, in a real castle, in a real medieval castle and it stood there and it's been refurbished by a, a Lord Dundonald that was his name and he owned that castle and he donated this to the Jewish children and he was told I presume what the purpose of that was to, to us and our boys and girls were put up in this castle. There were two floors, and of course the basement had a, a, a big kitchen and a great big assembly uh, hall where all I suppose in the old days the knights and all the knights in armor uh, met and dined. It was a great big dining room. So we uh, ourselves were quite self-sufficient. Su su uh, we organized ourselves whereby the boys went out and found jobs and the girls actually <coughs> took care of the food they cooked, they had the laundry and uh, we divided ourselves for those that wanted to go out and they found, <coughs> found jobs on farms we became farm hands and we received a, fa uh, uh, a salary at the end of the week, and we received the family. We brought it back, and we put it in the kupa. We actually lived like a kibbutz, exactly like a kibbutz. We took care of our own selves. All the money that we received, we put in the kupa. Plus, the girls did all the work. And. Uh, We stayed there for quite some time, several years, about two or three years, until this Lord Dundonald wanted his property back. Now, in that <coughs> castle, we lived uh, quite a religious life. Uh, you know, as we carried on in, in the Hapoel uh, Hamizrahi type of uh, method of living. We prayed every morning at Shacharis and Marif and Minche and Marif. In other words, we were religious. And we carried on our life almost as we did in Vienna before that. But still we were Zionists, but it was Torah ve Abuda. That means Torah and work. That was it. That's how we lived by. What kind of work did you do? I did farm work. I, I worked on a dairy farm, actually milking cows, and I was very, very good at that. I became uh, what they called 
a milk hand on the farm. And it was a very, very big farm that was very close to us, and they found that job. I actually, I uh, was lucky because even though we lived in the castle, now we had those much gifts. The guys that uh, uh, that uh, that took care of us, the elderly guys, but there also was a doctor there that lived, an actually doc, an actual doctor. This doctor was from Berlin. I uh, was a younger man, uh, I'm sure he was uh, matriculated, he was a doctor, a uh, practicing doctor, because he had that title, and he took care of us in case any of us were sick. We had sick rooms in the castle, that we, we, uh, we uh, devoted certain rooms, as a as, as type of a, uh, uh, rooms for those uh, children that became sick, and, and then some girls were trained as nurses also to take care of the sick. What was your typical day routine like? A typical day routine was we'd get, we'd get up early and we'd walk to work from the castle grounds. There were quite a lot of farms surrounding the castle grounds. There was also, I also took a job as a forest, as a forestry, uh, in forestry on the castle ground. Uh, there was a, forest, a, a forester that kept the castle in, in shape as far as the uh, forestry was concerned. And they were also hunting for certain things, uh, animals. And uh, we did that. Rabbits, there were swarms and swarms of rabbits all over the property. It was quite a large area, quite a large, you know, many acres. And uh, the, the castle kind of swooped down to the sea. So it was really very picturesque and very, very beautiful. Very, very lovely. As a matter of fact, when the castle dissolved, of course, we had to leave. Uh, this Lord and wanted his castle back for whatever reason he needed. It was his property. And we've had it for about three, three years, two or three years that we lived there. And uh, so the castle had to dissolve, the kids had to go out on their own. <clears throat> but while I lived in the castle, I snuck out at night because I received, at night or during the day, I received these letters from my parents that they wanted to leave, they, for me to find someone. How important it was that they someone would guarantee them a, a passage or a job in England. I hitchhiked, and believe it or not, I found such a person. I found such a person. This person was a professor at the Wrexham University, which was very close there, and it was quite a famous university in England. Just by luck, I told him my story. When we got in the conversation in the car, and I told him, this whole story of what it is and how important it is. And he said, I'm very willing to help you. I want to do this. I want to help you. And he was ready, and he went through the actual procedure with the, with the British uh, immigration authorities and started the whole procedure of guaranteeing all that, guaranteeing him a job even as, 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 as a uh, kind of a, uh, uh, maybe a, a help on the premises of the university to be a cleaner or something, or even or clean the, uh, the, 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 um, the classrooms or anything, anything, he, would, he wanted anything. And he started all that, but it was too late. The war had started, and we thought maybe he would do it through Hungary or through Switzerland, because they were neutral in those days. But it all was in vain. Nothing became of it. It was impossible. Impossible. Nothing became of it. What kind Couldn't of do it. There were no ways to transport them through Switzerland or through Hungary. There, were no, there was no way. It was too late. The war had started. We're coming to the end of the tape now. 
So. Ninety-eight. You're talking about trying to get your parents out. Well, it was completely in vain. I could. It was too late. There was no way. War had started, and uh, they were fighting in France, and bombings. And there was no possible way at all. Nothing. It was too late. Soon after, I would say about a month or two later, I got a, a, a Red Cross letter one of so many that so many other children before me received very the very same letter in through the red cross and we all looked around at each other all the kids they knew that one day sooner or later they will get such a letter because they left their parents behind Sorry, we have to inform you that your father has died in Buchenwald. And it said, this letter, this is a message from your mother. Please say Kaddish for your father for a whole year. And so many other kids before me received the same type of like similar to a telegram that your son or your or someone died like people received here in America when they went to the war. Your, your, your child or someone or your son has died. Well, this was very similar, very, very same thing. So many other kids received these. So that when, when we said, when we prayed every morning, there was always three, four, five, six, or seven, or eight kids that said, Kaddish, you weren't alone. I wasn't the only one. There were many others. We were all in the same boat, all of us. Soon after that, I received a message, which was a little more cheerful, to tell me that my brother, my younger brother Norbert, was sent out of one of the last kinder transports, one of the last ch children out of Vienna to America. He was sent during the war, mind you, when the war was going on with the sea, with the U-boats uh, attacking all the Allied shipping. He was sent to Lisbon, where he actually had his bar mitzvah in Lisbon. From there, from there, from Lisbon, he was lucky enough to catch a ship to New Orleans that took him to New Orleans. And from there, he was sent to Chicago to stay with a Jewish family in Chicago. He was saved. His life was saved. I was so happy. But I did not have his address or anything. I just knew that he was sent out, that he was lucky enough to be sent out. I didn't have his address. So later on, I would say two or three months uh, or four months later, I received another message through the Red Cross with his address in Chicago. Well. So soon we began uh, corresponding with each other through a certain mail that they called V-mail. There were a sheet of blue paper that was folded into a little square. It was very thin paper, which you couldn't really write a whole lot, but just the most important thing. Anyway, we were ha very happy to be in touch, and we corresponded with, with each other during the war with the V-mail, and we couldn't wait until the war was over. And then, of course, we started regular corresponding together. 
And my brother had then, my younger brother had then, uh, gone to work for Sears and had a very good, he, he actually had become a court reporter. And uh, he, had, he had gotten a job with Sears Roebuck. And so he'd stayed there, I think, for about a year or two, you know. And so he'd, he'd had enough, uh, enough, um, should we call, I don't know what they, by what they went to, but significance and, and the profit sharing in the, uh, in the Sears stock, that he was able to send an affidavit for me. And so then I came, I left London. How and long, where did you go after you left the castle? After I left the castle, after, oh yes, I forgot to mention this, after I left the castle, I actually hitchhiked to the nearest town. And there, I walked all alone, by myself, I suppose strange and different to English people. Soon, uh, an English policeman, a Bobby, picked me up and approached me and asked me, where am I going? What are you doing? Where, what are you doing here? So I told my whole story. I'm actually looking for some place to live and a job something that I could earn a living in a job. This policeman took me to the police station. He sat me on the counter and he told that story to all the policemen. And they all contributed their suggestions and uh, knowledge of people whom they know that might find use for me and they found me a job in a bakery, believe it or not, in a bakery. And they got me a job in a bakery and they found me lodgings in the most beautiful home with an English family, which was just down the block, of which they took me in as a lodger. It was a lovely English family, the name was Pearson very, very fine people. I lived with them. I went to work in the bakery and became a pastry chef, of all things. And uh, I worked there for about a year, year and a half or two years, and then decided to go to London because my friend, my best friend Ernie, lived in London with his mother and father, and I went to London to live with them. Soon as I came to London, I took a job with uh, one, of, one of the most prestigious hotels on Park Lane, uh, the Grosvenor House and the Dorchester House as a pastry chef, and I became a very, very good pastry chef. Uh, because I wanted to be uh, good in it. And I became a very good pastry chef. And I became the chef de partie, which is, means in charge of the pastry uh, department of the Grosvenor House. That was one job. I stayed there for about several years, maybe a year or two, and then had a better job offered to me at the Dorchester Hotel, a little further down. Uh, 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 on Park Lane, which paid a little more money. And so it became very good. So anyway, all this time I was in contact with my brother and uh, I wanted to join him and then of course he sent me an affidavit. Where were you when the war ended? When the war ended I was in London. Uh, I celebrated VE Day in London <coughs> um, in Piccadilly Circus of all places. I'm sure you saw some of the uh, news reels, how the people celebrated the ED in the streets. It was a very important, it was so, so important that uh, the war ended, ended for us in Europe because they sent all these rockets over to England and so many people got killed and burned down and maimed with these rockets. 
and they came in drones, one after another. And you could hear them come. All you had to do is just look up in the sky. You could see them, and they would stop and then glide. And wherever they would fall, you wouldn't know. But you knew when they fell, someone got killed. Some people got killed. Some people got made, got maimed. And lots of houses were destroyed. And who knows how many people got killed. And so it was so important, so important, that the Allies uh, would invade Europe and eventually go up on the, uh, on the west coast of Europe, of France and Holland, from whence they shot these rockets over to England. And uh, it was so important that the end. And when they did, this was the greatest jubilation in the world. When we heard that, when we saw that, when we read that, no one was more jubilant than the people of London, you know, because they had enough of the Blitz and everything else and those things. So this is where I celebrated the end of the war, the same as many thousands of other people. We were just happy and jubilant that the war ended in, in, in Europe. All we waited for one was VJ was, was Day, the uh, victory in Japan. And that came to eventually. And we were very, very happy about that. So anyway, I, I was celebrated both both Victory Days in England, VJ Day and VED. VED is, v is Europe, Victory in Europe, VJ Day is, of course, Victory in Japan. And we celebrated all those uh, victories then in, in London, same as many, many thousands. In the street, we went to Piccadilly Circus, same as so many, many others. We were so jubilant and so happy that the war was over. Well, soon after that, of course, I started planning my trip and, and, uh, and with, with Norbert to come to America. And I uh, came to Chicago. When did you arrive? I arrived in 1950. And um, it was uh, soon after the war, but you know, 1950. And, um, At my brother, I lived for a little while in a place where he lived and rented a room there and went to work in with 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 in the ba in the bakery uh, as a as a pastry chef because that's that's all I knew well, I soon realized that lots of people did not go very much for the pastry that I made because it was very, very rich. Extremely it was French pastry. And a lot of people were always thinking of their wastes and all, the, you know. So pretty soon I went out and I looked for a different type of, and I, I, I went and dabbled in jewelry and eventually found my, my way into the jewelry business. Uh, in Chicago, and um, I went to work in a, in, a, in a workshop, in a jewelry workshop, where they actually make jewelry from, from the beginning, so that I, I knew that if I'm going to go into this business, I better know what I'm doing, or what I'm saying, or what I'm talking about from scratch, from the very beginning. And I became very good in the jewelry business of which I am still now in. And, uh, well, now I'm almost retired, actually, at this stage of the game. But I still dabble every now and again in this here, but not too much. Did you get married? Yes. I, I found my wife, Sherry. Uh, she uh, worked for the same place that I worked for, in a jewelry store. I became, actually, an auctioneer, a jewelry auctioneer. And uh, I took a job in the auction, not as an auctioneer because I didn't know anything about auctioneering, but 
And I, uh, at that time, uh, was speaking English with an English accent still, like, like, you know. And lots of people would make fun of me, you know, calling me a limey and stuff like that, you know. We're speaking with an English accent. And uh, at any rate, I learned the auctioneering business very well, and I became a very good auctioneer. And I got to know the auction business very well, and the jewelry business. And that's what I did ever since then. I don't do the auctioneering anymore, so nevertheless, I'm still in the, in the uh, jewelry business. When you first came to this country, did you talk about your experiences, what happened to you leaving the country, leaving Vienna? Well, when I came to this country to talk about my experiences, my friends were the type of children who were similar to me. They had the same experiences that I had. So what can I tell them that they don't know and already went through them? We were all in the same boat. Now this is the thing that my brother did not have. My brother was three years my junior. He was, he was younger than I, than I. He was not thrown into the, the same environment that I was thrown in. We've seen, seen with a lot of the kids that had the same experience that I did. He was more or less alone, living with his family. He lived in, in Vienna when I was gone, when my father was taken to the concentration camp, when he died, in the, when my father died in the concentration when they were evicted from the apartment and thrown into a basement to stay there in a basement, in a dingy basement with my mother. I didn't go through that, he did. So he saw and actually lived through a lot more than I did. And I often thought about that. He was more or less uh, different from, from me. I had a different environment. He had all this by himself, no one to speak to about this. As a matter of fact, he talked very little about that. When I would bring the subject up, up to him and ask him, I felt, I felt in the conversation when I was talking to him that he did not, it wasn't the type of the subject he wanted to speak to, more that he wanted to forget about those days. He didn't want to think of this. He didn't want to be reminded of it. I felt that, so I let it go at this. I knew. I knew it was hard for him, so we didn't talk much about that. What about to your wife? My life? Your wife. My wife, she was an American girl that I met at the job in Chicago. She worked there in a different capacity in the jewelry. Uh, she was a, a skip tracer. I don't know if you know what that is, what a skip tracer is. A skip tracer is a person that find people that uh, skip their payments on their credits, uh, things that they buy on credit. Uh, she was able to find these people and uh, to uh, make them, so that they make their payments. And she got a, a commission. She was very, very good at that. Very, very good. When did you marry? We married in 1956. You see, in 1956, we married did she know in Chicago. You, did she know your history? Well, she knew my history because I told her, of course. It wasn't, I mean, uh, uh, it wasn't uh, hard to find out as soon as I opened up my mouth. But I became quite Americanized because I, I, uh, as soon as I went into the jewelry business, I had new friends, mostly uh, 
uh, guys from Chicago that were in the jewelry business with, with whom I palled around and uh, took on American methods and styles and ways of, of, of how to live the American way. Did you have children? Did we have children? We surely did. We had four children. We have three sons and a daughter. Uh, actually, not, well, actually, we had uh, two sons in a row, then a daughter, and then again a son. We have four. What are their names? They're my name, the names, my eldest son is Kenneth, Kenneth Lee. My uh, second uh, born son is Jeffrey. And my daughter's name is Judy. Judith, Judith Lynn, and my uh, third son is Richard, Richard Bradley, and my uh, sons uh, uh, still live in Chicago. My daughter married uh, a very fine uh, uh, Jewish boy from New York. And he is also doing very well. Both my sons are doing, all my sons are doing very well. I'm very satisfied, very happy with them. When the children were They growing have up. children, they each have children. My uh, daughter has um, three children. My... Uh, their names. Uh, their names. Uh, well, she, had, she just had a, a little girl by the name of Lara. Uh, Lara, then she has a um, a uh, son by the name of uh, Alex, Alexander, and then she has a son by the name of, um, oh my gosh, there's Alex, there is uh, Oh my gosh, I have so many, I can't think now. And then my uh, Sam, Sammy, we have a, a grandson by the name of Sammy by her, she has one. And then Alexander, and a little daughter by the name of Lara. And then uh, Kenny, my older son, has uh, a daughter by the name of um, uh, Jessica, and he also has a son by the name of Danny. Danny, my other son has a has two sons, Jason and Matt. So uh, we have some beautiful grandchildren, did your and they're growing up well. Did your children? ask you about their grandparents when they were growing Yes, up. they did. But there's very little I could tell them because I didn't know them myself. I didn't know my grandparents. So I can't tell them anything about it. As a matter of fact, uh, the only way I could surmise as to how come I didn't know much about them is because I'm sure my parents, my father and my mother, in those days were quite harassed too in Poland by anti-Semites with these various programs that they had. So I suppose they left Poland in a similar situation as I did. Did you your know? children ask about your parents? Yes, they asked about my parents, of course, all children would. I told them as much as I knew, as much as I could. They showed them pictures, they now have seen the pictures. I told them exactly what was going on and how, but... How did you find but out But they what, never met. How did you find out what happened to your mother? How did I find out what happened to my mother? Right after the war, I, I stopped having, right before the war, I had no trace. All letters and all uh, correspondence stopped with my mother. 
So there was no way that I knew where she was or what. There were organizations, fine, they call, they call themselves fine, find the bureaus, finding bureaus. These were situated all over Europe, all over America, all over, and they worked in conjunction with the Red Cross. And uh, they were able to find through various records that they, uh, that they uh, uh, were able to find how, I don't know. But I couldn't find any trace at all about my mother. And I didn't know what happened to her, none whatsoever. Until one day, I remember, we went on a trip, my wife and myself, to Israel. On that trip, uh, we went out and we went to a hotel. And in the lobby, I got into a conversation with one or, one or two people that were Holocaust survivors. Eventually, I told them my story, and I told them that uh, my father died in Buchenwald, and uh, that he's buried in Vienna. This lady looked at me as though I'm, I'm completely nuts, like I'm crazy. She looked at me, what, are you nuts? Are you crazy? This is what she said to me. Yeah, I'm a man already. I'm tw maybe 20, uh, well, I don't know how, how old was it, maybe 30, close to 30 years of age. And she says, this is what she says. What do you mean your, ma your, your father is buried there? Do you really believe your father is buried there? This is what she said. How naive can you be? This is what she said to me. I said, what do you mean? How naive can I be? These were the ashes. Well, do you think that, she says to me, do you think that's your father's ashes? You know how many people they killed in a concentration camp and they burned them? She talked to me like I'm a child, like I was a child. Little did I know then that this was happening because I, I was naive, to be very honest and truthful with you. They just got a hold of some ashes and they put it in a box and they send it to me. Whose ashes it is, it doesn't make any difference. And I thought, then I thought, same thing, what is the difference? We're coming to the end of the tape yeah. now. So they put in the